All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining so late in the day. Uh, I'm gonna keep this fun and upbeat because I know it's a little bit later in the day. It's kind of hard to get through lunch after, uh, you know, after, while you're digesting. I totally get how that goes. Uh, my name is Taylor Dolezal and I am from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation under the Linux Foundation. And uh, I'm here to talk about the impacts of cloud and infrastructure for the metaverse. So uh, as, as things go, it's always great to bring up some happenings within the community. And we saw one metaverse got uh, legs, which is pretty awesome to see. My Twitter feed was full of things saying like, we got pants now, which uh, gives one metaverse a leg to stand on. So that was kind of fun to see. I was at a event called ArgoCon, which was one of the CNCF projects, Argo, and that's used for continuous delivery and integration, workflows, um, and rollouts, just a whole bunch of things. And even they had announced that they were crafting a metaverse in which folks could interact on, uh, it was set on a fictional moon kind of entity. Uh, so you could actually go all the way around to the dark side of the moon. I didn't hear any Pink Floyd, but maybe that's a feature they'll add at some point in time. Uh, you can actually interact with folks on the moon, uh, look at PRs and other happenings uh, that are happening on GitHub, which is just a really interesting way to start thinking about things. So. Uh, some cool happenings within the ecosystem. Uh, as far as the agenda today, I definitely wanted to go through a little bit of the history of the metaverse uh, for folks not familiar. I always think it's really important to get a sense of what was so that we know where we're going and just being more informed in that way. Uh, talking through some of the technical concerns of the metaverse and giving it a little bit more apt definition uh, as we're seeing develop within the ecosystem and then end up with the cloud native metaverse and then kind of what we're seeing there. So uh, edgy clouds, you know, I put a metal icon in there because it literally is metal most of the time. Uh, pretty, pretty edgy. So uh, again, with the history, uh, really want to kind of dive into the metaverse. Where did this come about? Um, why is it called that? What are, what are some of those concerns? So when we take a look at metaverse, uh, it's not, it didn't begin as just one word. It actually started as two, meta and universe. Meta that beyond or transcending universe just a place that you can be. So metaverse, the place beyond, essentially, if you take the literal uh, translation. Uh, I, I feel that way sometimes waiting for my planes as things get delayed and whatnot. So definitely a, a strange metaverse to be in. The term metaverse was coined in a book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, I absolutely recommend that you do so. Uh, it's about a pizza delivery person uh, working for the mafia, and then uh, when they are in the metaverse, they're uh, really skilled swordsmen. So uh, again, really fantastic book. Uh, Neil, when he was imagining this and writing this, uh, this was before the internet, right? This is 1992, before it had really uh, gotten mass appeal and interactions. This is still the time of fax machines and blockbuster. Uh, we, we, it, we didn't have the metaverse in the way that we have it today. So really interesting to kind of see how he had imagined this uh, way back when. Uh, it was a little bit more stark of an outlook too. Um, and so that was something that he's warned about. He's actually not just an author, he's actually been pulled into a lot of technical contexts to advise companies, which I found interesting uh, kind of researching these slides. But he said, yo, I had no idea what was going to come about uh, in the days to come. So like, don't take my book as canon. Like you can decide a different future if you want. Um, and so that was really interesting too, to see how much has been mirrored out of this book as well. Uh, we've also seen like books like Neuromancer, Ready Player One, kind of also uh, helping to kind of uh, inject some new ideas into the community to kind of uh, drive off of, which is quite interesting. Uh, I wanted to kind of end this history section with a short story uh, because we're seeing so many things get developed within the metaverse space and not all of them will be the right fit. Uh, one such invention is actually the slinky. Uh, in 1943, it was uh, concepted as something to hold together weapons and rations and other things on a Navy ship. Uh, so if, if you can just imagine wrapping things up in a slinky, it doesn't really seem that efficient to me, but uh, it, it was at that point in time. Uh, the inventor, Richard James, as he was designing this, dropped it, and then it ended up kind of rolling across the floor and down some stairs. And uh, got dejected at first, but then he went, no, this, this is a good toy. It's, that's not, I don't want to use it to wrap things up. Let's make this a toy. 
Uh, and and th what a great use case, right? So that is the slinky that had completely different intentions at first and then evolved into something completely different. And that was, that's kind of what I want to frame this as, is something that is the art of the possible, just because we might not have things work out, which we won't as we develop different technologies in the metaverse context. Uh, some of them might have different, uh, you know, different outcomes than we intend, and that's a wonderful thing, uh, I think, personally. So, uh, as we get into some of the technical concerns around the metaverse and cloud native and edges and, and things of that nature, um, it's important to define what it is not. So uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot of these terms used synonymously, but they are not. Uh, the Web3 and the metaverse are both successor states to the internet as we know it today, but the definitions are different. Uh, Web3 doesn't directly require any 3D real-time rendered or synchronous types of experiences. And the metaverse doesn't require decentralization, distributed databases, blockchains, or that shift um, of interaction from platforms to users. So it's important to call those things out. It can have these things, uh, but it doesn't have to. Uh, the rectangle is a square, but not the other way around, all of those kinds of relations. Uh, what I have found is a really good definition of the metaverse was this. Uh, and, and I don't typically do this, I like to let people read the slides later, but uh, do you want to go through this and then I'll call out each of these bolded things in their own slides. So, defining the, metro, uh, the metaverse, a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds that can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users with an individual sense of presence, with, with a continuity of data such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. So let's go through those bolded terms because those are quite important when it comes to the metaverse. So first off, massively scaled. Uh, the metaverse gives us a really interesting way of interacting, right? It doesn't have to be a game. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, uh, some of the context that it's set up like right now it can be used to teach, just to interact. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we could do within that. But it also doesn't have to be the size or shape or volume of this earth or this world. It could be 100 times the size. You know, I don't envy people creating content for something so vast. But uh, it, we are not restricted to a subset in the metaverse. That is not the idea. It's to expand as much as we're, we're, uh, we're able to. And uh, we're not bound by those physical limitations, uh, just, just uh, what we design on the servers, which is quite interesting. The other thing is real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds. Uh, this has to be synchronous and persistent, and it is a different concern too, right? Uh, I used to work for Walt Disney Studios, and seeing some of those server farms at like Pixar and Disney Animation Studios, they're massive. They get really hot too, uh, lots of fans. Uh, I'm, I'm one of them, but uh, lots of other fans as well. Uh, it's, uh, it, it takes a long time to render some of these movie scenes out or some of these models. Um, some of which can be rendered in seven seconds. But if you can imagine walking up to a wall and waiting for the texture to render for seven seconds, and that's just at that point in time, shift your perspective, and then having to wait another seven seconds just doesn't work. Um, other kinds of rendering, it takes, you know, most, most groups are, are uh, used to them having to wait overnight, uh, submit that at the end of the day, come back in the morning, and then take a look at it at that point in time. That's not going to work. Uh, as you interact with your world as well, if you bump into the wall or if you're carrying a pipe or something like that and you hit the door, uh, the door frame, we want to capture that uh, potentially. You know, where you, where you knocked it, made a dent or something like that, and then your perspective. Is it just damaged or is it damaged in exactly the way in which you interacted with that and then other folks seeing that later? It's, it's, there are a lot of concerns that will come in that context. Uh, effect, uh, effectively unlimited users is also a really interesting context as well. Uh, as we play games like uh, World of Warcraft or most other, other games, there are lobbies. You're interacting with a subset of people. Um, you know, if we were in a metaverse right now, which maybe, maybe we are, um, this room being able to interact with everyone at the same time, that is the kind of context in which we should be able to interact. It shouldn't be, uh, it won't be like most games where it'll be like only eight people per lobby or per room, or I will be simulcast to just eight people at a time. Um, interacting with the internet right now is a very static, almost 2D kind of interaction 
but the metaverse allows for a literal 3D kind of interaction with different context, density, and areas. Um, so uh, being able to kind of have, and, and pagination in that, uh, in that sense, you know, we have to paginate results. If I search my name in Google and got the billion plus results back, I'm gonna be waiting a long time too, right? That's not efficient. These are things that we have to kind of figure out on that front. Um, so really another interesting thing to, to tackle from a mathematic standpoint as well as a uh, uh, architectural standpoint. Individual sense of presence was a really interesting component of the metaverse as well because it's when right now as you're playing a game or taking part of an experience uh, looking on the web, you are taking part in the thing. It's not taking part in you. Uh, so much. Uh, within the metaverse, we would go and stand on a beach and look at a sunset. But, um, you know, right now we're kind of working within the platform or the framing that we have right now. We're kind of, we have to kind of uh, adjust to the platform that we have rather than uh, having that du full duplex kind of interaction with our environment. So also another uh, really interesting concern. And then last but not least is that continuity of data. If you think back to Super Mario Brothers kind of uh, in some of the older platform games, you would go through, you know, heaven forbid anything bad happens to you and then you have to start back from the beginning. Uh, that would be a horrible metaverse type of experience, right? As you go through, it's, uh, you know, it's supposed to mirror real life as much as possible, but if you're, you know, every time you log in, you don't have a wallet or currency or identity, we're gonna be running into problems. And so that, that persistence absolutely needs to be there. Um, and then also, uh, one thing I'll talk about here momentarily is the edge versus the cloud and kind of like how we set up some of those architectures as well. So the cloud native metaverse, we've kind of covered some of the tenants and those concerns and, and really quickly I wanted to run through some of the things that have, come, have started to come up in conversations I've had with folks um, uh, right now. It's, it's metaverse themed and they don't even know that yet and uh, other things that are going to definitely become uh, part of the conversation soon. So as I was doing some research and, and talking with folks and, and prepping for this session, uh, a lot of what I heard was uh, the cloud and the edge and having those things inform one another. They don't have to, they should not operate independent of one another. Uh, the edge is at location as much as the cloud is. Being able to have that um, that low latency, that quick access time. Uh, latency, we just can't have that when it comes to the metaverse and, and those kinds of interactions. Being able to store things at the edge and then having the edge be intelligent enough in how to operate with that data is gonna be vital and so important as well. Um, say if I log in in the US, maybe my data is stored and accessed differently than if I were in the EDU, uh, abiding by GDPR, you know, uh, click allow, allow cookies and, and, and all of those things as well. Having something be smart about your actual location where you log in uh, is something that's going to come across uh, quite often within this space. Uh, digital, digital twins was also something that was really interesting. Uh, there were a couple case studies published. One was like Anheuser-Busch, where they actually uh, scanned and mapped out all of their distilleries and breweries, and they're able to actually take those, uh, you know, they've mapped it out digitally, and be, to be able to kind of uh, run simulations on things. What if we put more fluid through, more pressure through the pipeline? Um, how do we get higher yield? Oh, this is going to break down in five months those kinds of situations become available, which is really interesting. So being able to see, you know, oh, if I park my car like this and it snows like that, maybe can I get out the next day? You know, all of those things are going to come about as potential, uh, potential solutions that you can take a look at. Um, mixed reality is also really interesting in this space um, because for the metaverse, you can observe it from a screen. Uh, you can put on goggles and be fully immersed in it. Uh, it can be AR as well, or it can kind of be a mix between the two or something projected into the space in which we are right now. Um, there's a lot of ways in which to tap into that, and there hasn't really been that full distinction of like, no, it only is this, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, autonomous systems as well, so something that is able to kind of map to the real world as well as always be running. Right? If we're playing video games or websites, websites might ex experience some changes in the background. These autonomous systems might have some kind of storyline or something that shifts based on the data going in and out of it. But um, within the metaverse, that's always going. That's always flowing. There's always data going through it. It's, it's, it's alive. It's living. It's breathing. Uh, those are kinds of data concerns that we just haven't seen before either, uh, unless it's a, a massively scaled application. 
Uh, within the cloud native space, uh, the cloud and edge computing concerns are the thing I come across most frequently. Uh, I was speaking with an international organization uh, just a couple days ago, and they said that as they gather data at their edge, which is petabytes of data, um, there are different kinds of assertions they want to run on that data, as well as report on and notify on. And then as things trickle up into their clouds, they're only storing hundreds of gigabytes at that point in time. So literally where that data is accessed and based on its context, it's just used very differently. And that kind of makes sense, right? To have a, a slew of this information at the edge, quickly able to kind of work with it and crunch it um, and then store what's meaningful and really worthwhile insights, yeah, keeping that for a long time in the cloud. It kind of pairs very closely with warm storage, cold storage, and some of those concerns. We're starting to see that get mirrored in those contexts as well. Um, the logo that I have here is Cube Edge, which is one project that's within the CNCF landscape. Uh, it's in an incubating state. We have three different variations of sandbox incubating and then graduated, just kind of showing where it's at in its journey uh, with the community, adoption, and just kind of uh, the people that have been testing it and working with it in production. Um, that one's been really interesting. Uh, we, we have many of them. Uh, some written in Rust, Wasm, there, there are a whole bunch of different uh, projects that are within our landscape, but this one's a little bit further along in the incubating state. And then I uh, threw up a uh, little bit of an architecture just to give an idea of some of the concerns that it handles. Uh, it's really important to get together and to have these talks in a vendor neutral space so that we can kind of establish these abstractions and then bind to them. It's gonna make our jobs a lot easier rather than maintaining you know, uh, 12 or 13 different implementations of this. Uh, one of my favorite comics I don't have linked is the XKCD, um, it, like there are 13 competing standards and it's like we should unite this, make this uh, a little bit better. There are 14 competing standards. Um, it helps to work and talk together and kind of establish what's important and exactly where the line is, where those definitions are in a codified way. So one thing that's neat about CubeEdge is that it uses MQTT to kind of, uh, that's the messaging protocol in which all these layers are linked together. And then again, we can kind of get all this information back up to the cloud where we want to store it indefinitely and then uh, kind of operate within the edge capacity. This project works in a provisioning kind of context as well. But again, you know, the, the, with software, with anything else, one size never fits all. There's going to be a lot more contexts in that case. Uh, rounding things out, uh, kind of how to get involved. Uh, we, at the CNCF, we have over 800 members, so uh, really have wild and awesome conversations uh, across many different contexts. Um, you don't have to join as a member to take part in these either. You can come join a technical action group uh, or a user group and kind of have discussions, you know, really try before you buy, uh, see who all is there and what the conversation topics are. Um, it's, it's really nice being in that community. You know, there's nothing closed sourced about it. There's really no secrets. You could go check it out. There's, there's so much there. Uh, and again, lots of folks talking. Uh, this is the first stop of many for me this week. Uh, later this week, I'm going to be going to Detroit. Uh, we have KubeCon. If you aren't attending, uh, I know it's last minute. The conference kicks off next week. But if, you know, if you've got open plans, you should come join us. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about Kubernetes, Edge, and, and a whole bunch of other concerns on that front. So registration is open there. And uh, really just want to make myself available. If there's any questions that you have, uh, again, my bias and my kind of context is cloud native and interacting with these systems and, and different clouds and end users. Uh, but uh, wanted to leave you with my, my uh, email and then happy to chat with you in the uh, hallway track as well. But uh, really just a lot, of, a lot of things to talk about here. It's still early days, um, but, you know, and we're still kind of writing that definition and creating this technology. So it's going to be really important to share what we've learned and tell the stories of people that are able to actually have a lot of success in different ways. But uh, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. And uh, yeah, just about dinner time. Should we go? <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's a good question. I have not looked. So the question was, uh, are there going to be metaverse discussions next week? Uh, I, I, I need to check the schedule. I think I might have seen one or two, but I'd have to go and check again. I know, I know there'll be one in the hallway track, and it'll be from, from me.
Yeah, great question, great question. So when it comes to the definition, I, I do agree. I think it's a, it's a good placeholder and a good way to frame things, but they don't have to be just yet because we, you know, in tech, we, the, the common answer is, well, it depends. And we kind of get into that a lot. And it, and it does depend. You know, it's what's the context, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, and that's, that's, that's not always apparent. And sometimes we get to the end, we're like, oh, we're solving for a different problem, shoot. And then you have to kind of uh, adjust on that front. But I do think that this helps even, even the definition of like cyberspace in, in kind of that, like no one calls it that anymore. And so I think that different instantiations and terminology will be introduced that better tracks what those technologies and what those solutions are by the time that we get to them. So I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's a good way to kind of frame things that might not be there and kind of help direct within a certain capacity um, to kind of urge that to come forward uh, and, and then allow for kind of iterations as time goes on too. Great question. <laughs> I'll, see, it's, I'll, I'll see if we can work cyberspace in here, yeah. 3D virtual world in the meta area, cyberspace. The super cyber meta space, yeah, got it. <laughs> Absolutely. I do think that I do think that clouds will have to uh, adjust to put forth new offerings for sure. I, I, I think that kind of seeing different, uh, I've seen the, the major clouds provide things like outposts and other things that operate with at the edge, so you have that API and you can kind of interact with resources in a similar fashion that you're used to. But I do think that there will need to absolutely be, like, a, like 3D rendering is, is, is something I really think is going to have to be subsidized at least first by the CSPs. Um, I don't see a cheap way of, of kind of providing that to consumers at this time, being able to run that out of their homes. I uh, hope so, you know, soon, sooner than later, but uh, it's just very cost prohibitive right now. Um, but uh, even seeing like blockchain solutions come along from major clouds as well, I definitely think again we'll need to kind of have that shift, and then and then that will spur innovation, and we'll be able to figure things out as we kind of denature that problem a little bit. Absolutely. Still not quite It's, it's really interesting to see that, that kind of dialogue happen too, is like in, in, in a lot of these dystopian kind of fictions, you see like somebody is living in uh, a trailer park or kind of having this like uh, pizza delivery job, you know, in their role. And it's, it is so much better to kind of escape that. Um, you can kind of face the what is uh, this, this kind of oblivion thing or this infinite kind of possibility thing, you know, when, when you jump into that context. But there are concerns too around like even marketing, you know, folks are kind of uh, speculative and, and like Times Square, is it going to be like, you know, 30x, you know, times the billboards that you see, people don't want that, you know, more or less. So even those kinds of ethics and concerns will vary too. Those will be on different growth modifiers and kinds of strange things too, potentially.
that's a lot of organizations are trying to do is get in early when it's a little bit more cost effective to before it's defined because if you wait too long it can be it can it can be very difficult to break into as well 100% agree but uh, yeah I remember buying stars and, and things like that earlier on in my life but yeah uh, buying digital property I've, I've yet to do And, and you can experience it too. You can pull out the spark plugs and look at them. Whereas, like, if you did that in a store, people would be like, whoa, you can't stop. But uh, I, and I. I know we're running out of time, so I'll keep it short. But I'd love your conversation. I think the philosophical re real issue with the metaverse, and quite frankly, with blockchain, is finding that zeitgeist that users, I'll say gamers for now because I'm coming from gaming, that actually want. Because right now, I'm seeing a whole lot of Yeah. You know, and you're not differentiating from the metaverse. I, it's worth it. We even know what the metaverse is. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the want has to be there. But uh, awesome. I'll be here till uh, late tomorrow. But uh, thank you all, everybody. This is fantastic. Great conversation. Thank you.